Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Crime Centric. This being a show is about crime dramas that I watch. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Killing Eve. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, let's start off with continuing where we left off with uh, Carolyn's story. We kind of go back in time to 1979, which I think is so fascinating that I guess to some extent she helped she was one of the founding members of the 12 because she was part of an anti-establishment group, kind of almost like an anarchist group that eventually she was like, oh, like, what do we need, need to name ourselves? It's like, oh, how many of us are here? So you're like, okay, so I guess she infiltrated a group early on. She was infiltrating the group early on. So... She has deep ties to the 12, and maybe that's why she's so like, no, the 12 can't be destroyed. I mean, this thing has been around for a while, but she remembers when it was kind of nothing. But maybe that's also why she doesn't think there's any connection there, because I guess like over the years, just everything kind of fell apart. So I guess she just assumed like maybe she didn't correlate like right this group that's named the 12. It's like there's no way it's the 12 I know. At least, I, once again, I have not rewatched season two, but it never really came up in season three. But maybe it came up in season two, and I just don't remember. I don't, I don't know if she's ever correlated that she's had such deep ties to the twelve in that regard. But also, like I said, maybe that plays into why she so uh, believes, like, oh, it, it, it can't be defeated. But um, just seeing her in her younger days, uh, her and her boyfriend, who is Lars, but his real name's like. Uh, Yakim, uh, Yahim, or something like that. It's I think it's kind of like Yakim, but I, I always say Yakim, but it's like it's like Yahim, uh, Yohim. Um, regardless, I'm going on a tangent for no reason. Um, she was kind of in a relationship with him, but that was kind of part of her cover. And then there's a group guy in the group, uh, the mute that doesn't really talk much, that she kind of had a thing for. And it's like, oh, like don't get too attached. And he's like, okay, sure. And he bounces, and she was almost kind of like, huh. I wasn't kind of expecting that. I thought it would be a little bit more connectivity between us, but it's like, and I think that almost plays into, I think it's, you know, a byproduct of her dad raising her to be like, right, very like, uh, you, you, you use people and you kind of move on. Like a lot of her mentality, we got a glimpse of it with her dad and um, her dad was basically like, right, don't let someone find out about you. Because I, if you got killed, I basically have to deal with, like, the crap everyone would be giving me that, like, oh, my own daughter got found out and killed because someone found out of her being a spy type of thing, you know? So it, just that little interaction was kind of nice. It was actually really sweet to see, like, Carolyn with her dad. And so seeing the time she spent with this group. And it's fascinating because we got a lot of really interesting insight into her. Um especially when we ultimately, when she finds her dad dead, because it was like, oh, some, I forgot the exact word her dad used, but it was like, yeah, found out, don't come in. She comes in and finds her dad dead. And it's like, it puts so much in perspective. When Vlad, like, said, like, yeah, one of the people we were pushing because you wanted us to ended up killing herself because um, she didn't want to be exposed. And the fact is, like, right, she didn't do it in front of her children. Now it makes sense why that hit her so hard. Because now it's like, right, she basically helped do to someone else what happened to her dad. And it's like, Jesus. I was like, no. And it also plays into why Carolyn is the way she is. Like, we see little elements of her personality that she has present day, even in her younger years. But then you add in this aspect of what happened to her dad. And now you have, now it kind of plays into why she acted the way she did when Kenny died. Like, it, like she didn't make a fuss of it necessarily. Like, she broke something and then she was like, all right, uh, how, who wants to trash this place? Because it's like letting them trash it was her way to kind of keep... It was her, like swirling with anger and just sadness on the inside but then she's allowing everyone else to do the destruction around her but it's also because she's keeping an eye on everyone because she's like but she's like who would have done that who would have been able to find out and it's like right mute guy was there when um the guy her dad was shagging like they saw each other across the way and waved to each other and when they, they both left so it's like He's the only one that could have exposed her dad and blackmailed him like that. And so she sneaks in there. It didn't even register in my head when she was looking at the um, the uh, passport and stuff. 
it didn't finally click to me until like a little bit before it gets revealed that that was Constantine. Because I heard the laugh early on. I was like, wait, is that Constantine? I'm like, uh, I put, I brushed it aside. It's not until that final scene to them, like when they're younger together and he laughed. I was like, because Constantine has a very unique laugh. I was like, that's fucking Constantine. And it's like, super is. Because uh, I think the photo you saw of them back in like season one was like the current the actors who play them now, present day, just kind of playing them like a little bit younger. Like, you know, we go even further back. But it's like, yo, her and Constantine have, like, you knew they had history. They have history. I'm surprised you could ever be copacetic around Constantine. But I guess it's like, right, it's part of the spy game. We've been through so much. You've done stuff to me. I've done stuff to you. Uh, we've done stuff together. The whole... Um, well, Lars ended up, like, they ended up bashing him in the head almost, uh, oars, and I love it. it's just kind of like, they hit him over the head, he falls into the water, he gets back up, and they go, bam, 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 they're both taking turns, like, whacking, they both whack him, like, five times each, so I was like, interesting, I also thought it was fascinating that she kind of had him, like, again, just like the season three finale, she had him, gun pointed at him yet again, and she was going to let him live, but she was like, I need you to do something for me, so I guess that kind of plays into, like, some of the other story we know, like, Constantine eventually screwing over Vlad, and Vlad never knowing the truth about all that, like, I, I'm assuming that was set up for that, but it's like, how could you ever, that speaks volumes about Carolyn, um, I know just how she like processes everything that is like Constantine is a means to an end, but it's like, right, this man not only is responsible for your dad's death, he's also responsible for your son's death. No wonder you were ready to kill him. It was because it wasn't just about Kenny. It's like, it's just history repeating like two important people in my life you took from me. And I, you know, that's why she was the mom that she was because of what happened with her dad. Like it's just. Once again, I think the spy world kind of builds you like that, but I think it's like losing her dad the way she did really shook her to the core. Um, especially it also hurts knowing like, right, Kenny had questions on whether or not Constantine was actually his dad or not. So it's like, once again, not directly responsible, well, all directly responsible. It was an accident with Kenny. It was just the haphazards of the job when it comes to his, um, when it came to Carolyn's uh, dad. But that was fascinating. Running into, what is it, Katarina? And her being like, oh, kind of like, she used to be so jealous of uh, Carolyn. And she was like, right, if I, um, if I knew, I'm glad to see, basically, I'm glad to see where you look, ended up. Because it was, it was, it was her throwing shade. Because she's like, oh, man, I was so wondering what your life was going to be like. I'm so glad I finally have an answer. Because in her head, it's probably like, oh, you're doing all these wonderful things. But now it's like, oh, I see where you are in your life. It makes me feel better about where I am in my life. And Carolyn saw all her throwing all that shade. It's like, I don't care. Got more important things to do. But I did like her talking to Constantine later on, present day, being like, right. Do you ever think about... You know, if we hadn't done what we did, like, where our lives would be, like, the fact is we'd still both have, like, our children, like, she still has, what well, almost feels a little backhanded, because like, once again, you have your daughter, but you were just kind of moving on from that, um, Constantine has his daughter, but I think the last time we saw Arena, she was getting in one of those facilities, because it's like, right, she did run over her mom's boyfriend, so... I think that's, I want to say that's the last time we saw Arena. I wonder if she make any small appearances this season or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was interesting that things were a little sentimental in that moment. Cause I think Carolyn's like, right. If we had play, if things had played out differently back then, who knows what our lives would be like right now, uh, things would be different. You know, maybe my dad still be alive. My mom, I mean, uh, that, uh, my, uh, my son might still be alive. Like things could have been different. They would have been different people. So that's the sad thing about living in what ifs, because there's no turning back the clock on any of that. So that was quite fascinating. So you have that side of things. At the same time, Constantine is, you know, doing his training of Pam. <clears throat> Obviously, it's like, right, don't do that again, or I'm basically going to uh, grind you up. I'm going to cut you up and eat you. So also changing her clothes and everything. And she's like, what's wrong with what I'm wearing? It's like, no, it's not what you use. It's not the type of stuff you'd wear when you want to like, basically get someone's attention or make them notice you or make them fall in love with you. Because, you know, it's part of the trade or the job. They're like, right, sometimes you're going to have to black widow this. You kind of draw people in and then kill them. Um, but I love that she's putting on those clothes. And I think some of those clothes are meant to be like very Villanelle style. Uh, and maybe he treats all the trainees like that. So... Villanelle kind of adopted that style and made it her, but maybe all eventual, like, 
assassins that have been, you know, trained under him will eventually get like that. But Pam just kind of felt a little out of place. So she ends up going to that dude at the carnival or fair or whatever and ended up getting him to get her some clothes and i love that he's kind of like oh like talking to himself trying to psych himself up trying to have like a pretend conversation with her and um they hit it off and i'm like oh that's sweet i hope it doesn't turn into uh what was his name again sebastian the dude from um that him and um from i wouldn't say for season one it's him and um villanelle sadly like there was kind of a thing between them and he ended up getting into the po uh, perfume she had made uh, that was poisonous, and he ended up killing himself in the process. And she was like, oh, well, that was kind of taken care of, and that was that. Poor bastard. Like, I hope Pam and that guy don't turn into that. I could definitely see that being a repeat of that. But I did like how that all ties into Villanelle's story, how Villanelle, like, was doing um, Bonita, like, a... Uh, um, is it Bonita or Benita? I think it's Benita. Uh, doing her a favor because it turns out she's got an abusive husband. And the, the dark, fucked up uh, um, irony behind it is like, oh, he's a firefighter. He's supposed to put out fires and not start them because he burns her. So she knows what Villano does. And it's like, right, I'm sure I found one of the fingers underneath the bed from that dude last episode. I'm sure he got what he deserved. Do you think the same thing could be... Could you do this... Could make sure my husband gets what he deserves? And so... Villanelle gets... If this was something... I'm... There is a morbid part of me that's like... I'm curious what that looked like from the other side. From Villanelle's perspective. We get it from his perspective of just kind of like... Oh, like we just see like the water gushing from Villanelle. But when she stuffed the holes in him and turns it on... Like I was like... I was almost like... I guess it'd just be him drowning. I guess that's all it is. Because I was like, well, would it get to the point, like, would the water start, like, making his eyes bulge a little bit? Would it start coming out of his nose, his ears? Like, how would that work? Or would it just, like, you know, just straight up drowning? Um, maybe that's all it is. But it's just enough that the water would start spraying back on her to such a heavy volume like that. It's like, you'd almost expect his head to explode from all of that. But, no, it's just mainly going down into his gut and just drowning him from the inside like that. But still... So she goes back, but Benita's also brought in other people. It's like, right, their husbands are, uh, well, they've got their own versions that, uh, you know, like my husband, like, uh, they've got their own to deal with. Like, could you help them out? And Vanilla, Villanelle's like, all right, cool. I've got my own to deal with. And at first I was like, is that Constantine? I was like, well, you've already tried to kill Constantine. Um, and so I was like, it had to be Helen. And it's like, yeah, that's who she's after. So she actually comes to visit him. And uh, I, I really like, uh, I, I was um, I almost wanted some more interactions between Pam and Villanelle. Like maybe we'll get some more of that uh, before the season ends. Well, before the series ends, we'll see. But I love their back and forth and stuff. That is like she's asking questions. He's like, "What? You're not gonna ask how I'm doing?" It's like, "How are you doing?" And he's like, "You know, here I am. I'm training this newbie and everything." And um, it leads to this interesting conversation where she wants to go after Helen, and then. You know, it's like, right, she's like, I'm doing this charity work and stuff like that. And it's like, but yeah, I first realized I really do appreciate charity and stuff. You have to, charity starts at home. So she's got to deal with her own stuff because she's like, yeah, I'm up here um, killing everyone else's issues and, you know, not really dealing with my own. And Helen's like my number one top issue right now, so... But I thought it was kind of this interesting line of dialogue she had towards um, Constantine when she was like, you never believed him. He's like, of course I did. He's like, no, you believed I could be a killer, but you never believed I can be anything more than that. And he's like, right, I'm sorry. The way I handled you, I shouldn't have, I've learned from that and I'm trying to do things differently with Pam. But she also says this line I thought was interesting where it's like, oh, um, you eventually the people you train, you can't train people to kill and them not to come after you. One of these days, somebody's going to get you. One of them is going to get you. And I'm immediately like, oh, it, is it going to be Pam? Pam is it? I, I think Pam might be the one that ends up ultimately killing Constantine in the process. I was about to say like if not if it's not Villanelle, I mean once again she's tried, but there's also like there's a little mutual love in its own twisted way. Even to the point later on like he gives her the address to like another assassin he trained. But it's like oh I think you guys will get along and they hug. And I think Villanelle's not quite sure. It's hard to say how she's feeling about because you tell Constantine hugging and I think it's probably a little weird for both of them to have such an intimate moment but it's this thing of like right will this be the last time we see each other um how do we both really feel about this you know I think a lot of that kind of flows through their minds in that moment um and that ultimately in itself ties into everything that um 
Eve is up to. Eve went full blown, going to the trouble of kidnapping Helen's daughter. And the moment she showed up at the game and everything, I was like, oh, what's that? I was like, oh, that's mommy's friend Eve. It was like, huh? And I love that when Yusef got there and it was like, wait, do you have someone in there? I was like, wait, does he have, does she have Helen in there? I wasn't, I didn't quite get the grasp of everything. But the moment I saw the crayons, I was like, oh. You took her daughter's here. So I was like, why are you hiding that? I was like, oh, it's because you don't want him to know you're babysitting her daughter. It's like, oh, you don't want him to know you straight up kidnapped her daughter. I was like, oh, I thought this was like something between you and Helen in like a good way. It's like, no, you kidnapped her daughter. And it's like, huh, you kidnapped her about 10 a.m. We would say at best 11 a.m. is when Helen find out. So she pretty much might be on her way right now to London. So, but it's like. Helen crossed the line the moment she released Villanelle from prison and it's like alright she wants to go there we can go there it's like right you want to go toe to toe with something that's obviously important to me like I can go for what's important to you too so but it is kind of like this adorable thing between Eve and um isn't her daughter's name like uh God, because her daughter's name was referenced before, like in a text message, and I, I'm blanking on it but it was actually cute, adorable like when that, that college um class and uh, the nudity was on screen and Eve was trying to cover her face. I'm like, oh no, here, uh, you want to play games on my phone? Can I? It's like, yes, of course. It's really sweet. Um, even to the point when they meet up later on, it's like, oh, we got to go. But then her daughter's like, can I stay with Eve? Goes over and hugs Eve. It's like, ooh, middle fingers. I love it so much. And Eve's just so smug about it. Like, oh yeah, uh, don't worry. I didn't tell, no, I didn't pump her. She didn't tell me anything because she doesn't really know you. It's like, oh, sticking the knife in just a little deeper. I'm like, look at you, Eve. There was even, because it interestingly enough ties in with the whole uh, thing that was getting discussed in the class of like how far down, essentially, uh, me metaphorically speaking, it was like how, basically how long, far down the rabbit hole do you have to go? Like, who do you have to become to get what you want in the end? And the same thing could be said, like, even this moment, she is becoming, she has for a long time started becoming someone that maybe, you know, maybe she doesn't recognize anymore, but like, how long are you going to go down this route uh, before it completely consumes you, like there's none of uh, no bit of the OG Eve uh, Palastri left, you know. And I love that even later on when she t meets up with Helen, Helen's like, "Oh, you think I was going to kill you or something?" She's like, "Honestly, when I met you at first, I thought you were pretty pathetic. Like when I was like, oh, like you're kind of not. That basically you spend so much time peering into the darkness because you're peering at people that are more interesting you. But then look at I. I was surprised when I found out like the wings that you built yourself. They're shitty." pigeon wings but they're wings nevertheless that you you've sprouted your own wings and started to fly they're pretty shabby but still so right i found lars let's go but i'm like that's interesting because carolyn found lars and i love that she's like oh you can shoot me but if you shoot me you won't have to you won't hear all the interesting stuff i've got to say so we'll see how that conversation plays out next episode but it turns out Helen was coming after, because it's like, oh, we're waiting out here. I'm like, at first I was like, is it going to be Yusuf? But it's like, Yusuf is kind of like a, a booty call. It's like, yeah, I like you. We're, we work together, but it's like, it's nothing like love related. But the moment it came to Villanelle, it's like she got out of the car and immediately started choking Helen. It's like, let me out the damn car. Because, um, and it was also interesting. What was the thing that ended up stopping, um, uh, Villanelle? It was a statue of Jesus. So, of course. Um, but apparently she gets an arrow and I'm like, do you think that was Pam who did that? Because of the context of some of the promo I see, I know Eve's not dead. I mean, not Eve, but I know Villanelle's not dead. I'm just curious, did, uh, cause obviously that deep hugging and stuff they did. I'm like, it is something in the back. Cause she has like a bag on her back, doesn't she? So I was like, is, did that protect her? Uh, from the arrow, did it just not go through? Did she fake being dead long enough for Helene to get away, or what? Or does Eve end up resuscitating because she was almost dead but not dead? Or did Constantine like give her a bit of a heads up about something? Because I was curious, like, was that someone else doing that, or was that um, was that Pam who shot the arrow? I don't know. I feel like it wouldn't be Pam because she's still so green at all of this. So I'm assuming it had to be someone else. Uh, not unless it was. The, I don't think it was the well. Because I'm about to say, I think that was, I wonder has she been, she's probably been keeping tabs on Villanelle ever since Villanelle left, like after Villan, after she released Villanelle from prison, she's probably been keeping a tab on her the entire time. Because it's also like, right, she didn't, um, 
do the job she was supposed to anyway, because she was supposed to kill Carolyn, but she didn't, so I guess that was kind of like the final straw, so I guess that's why it's like, right, I'm hurting Eve, but also, like, I needed to punish uh, Villanelle for failing to do what I, I went out of the way to, like, break you out of prison and everything, and you still didn't do the job you were supposed to, so... It's definitely going to be interesting to see where this goes because the kid gloves are going to be off now between Elaine, Helen and um, Eve. So it's going to be interesting to see where all of this ends up taking us going forward into the next episode. Um, the whole what conversations we're going to get up to with um, uh, Carolyn and Lars or how about... The whole thing with Constantine and Pam and maybe how he feels about this Villanelle thing. I don't think he co-signed that, but we'll, we'll see. But uh, really, that's all I'm going to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.